Hi everyone. We're excited to release the Move Durham draft plan for public comment. And to help you as you review the draft plan and provide feedback, we put together this short recording to walk you through the various elements of the draft plan, um, highlight the key recommendations, and explain some of the, the different ways that you can provide feedback. Move Durham is a long range vision plan for transportation in central Durham. It will set policy and infrastructure priorities that will be used to seek funding and implement projects in the future. But it's important to understand that this plan does not come with specific funding. Rather, it sets the vision based on public input for transportation in central Durham. The orange area on this map represents how we're defining the study area of central Durham. And it's generally with I-85 to the north, US-70 to the east, Riddle Cornwallis Road to the south, and US-15501 bypass to the west. The plan began soon after the city adopted the Equitable Engagement Blueprint, and we use this opportunity to implement more equitable engagement processes and test different techniques. We also looked at the demographics of the area, metrics about transportation needs, such as car ownership, access to grocery stores and places of employment to help guide our plan development. The dark orange areas on this map highlight the areas of central Durham that have the highest concentration of transportation need. The vision that was developed during this process says that whether traveling by bus, foot, bike, or car, people in central Durham will be able to move safely and reliably. A more convenient and connected multimodal transportation network will ensure that moving in central Durham is affordable and equitable for all. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our existing conditions findings and you can find more detail about this in the Durham Today chapter of the draft plan. We looked at a lot of different things for existing conditions, such as safety analysis, really trying to understand the, the existing traffic volumes and traffic patterns, as well as the forecast for traffic into the future. And a critical reason that we decided to do this vision plan now is to anticipate and address the changes that will occur with the opening of the East End Connector project later this year. This map shows the change in traffic volumes that are forecasted by the transportation demand model. Green is an increase and red is a decrease, and the width of each corridor represents the magnitude of change. Traffic volumes are forecasted to decrease on NC 147, Alston Avondale, Holloway Street, Fayetteville Street, Roxborough Mangum Streets, and Duke Gregson Streets. This change provides a great opportunity to reimagine the purpose that these streets play in our transportation system. However, as evident with the pandemic, decreased traffic can also result in increased speeding and reckless driving. Also, as growth continues, these routes may quickly fill back up with traffic, and so it's really important for us and the community to come together and have a conversation on what we want these streets um, to look like and be within Central Durham. We also use cell phone travel data to look at where traffic is going, the length of trips, and determine through trips versus local trips and highlight the detailed origin destinations of trips within the study area. The dark orange areas of this map you know, highlight that the key destinations people are coming to Central Dur Durham for are downtown, Knight Street, Duke Street Corridor, and Northgate area. Looking specifically at pedestrian crashes, we found that there are 597 pedestrian crashes occurring within the study area between 2007 and 2015. And over 80% of those crashes were on roadways with a 35 mile an hour or 45 mile an hour speed limit. And this is important to understand because we know that when a pedestrian is hit by a person driving 30 miles per hour, they have a 40% chance of being killed. And when that driver is driving over 40 miles per hour, the likelihood of a fatality is 80%. Looking specifically at trip length, we really try to understand of those people driving within the study area, um, not only where they were headed, but how long their trip was. And this graphic just shows the difference um, based on miles and converts that to what that could look like as a walking trip or a bike trip. So we found that about 29% of trips are less than two miles, which could easily be converted to a walking or bike ride for many. 
Um, transit can also provide a great option for some of these trips, especially 40% of the trips that are currently um, five miles or more within the city area. The light rail project died during the development of this plan, which caused us to pivot some of our transit analysis to focusing on bus service and how infrastructure changes on these streets could benefit the bus system and bus riders. We looked at transit boardings by route, transit through trips, and access to bus stops by sidewalks. We used all of our existing condition findings, as well as our community input um, feedback that we had from, from residents to identify key priority corridors of the, plan, of the project. And you'll find a chapter devoted strictly to these priority corridors. The corridors that were looked at um, in more detail and develop design alternatives include Duke Gregson Street, Mangum Roxborough Street, Austin Avondale, Fayetteville and Elizabeth Street, Holloway Street, Chapel Hill Street, and the Durham Freeway. Corridors were selected prior to the light rail project dying, and that's the reason why some streets were not selected, such as South Austin Ave and Irwin Road. Our public engagement was split into two separate phases. Phase one was the beginning of the project um, and was generally focused on general feedback on how people currently move in and out of um, central Durham. And you'll find all of the information, what we heard summarized in the what we heard chapter of the draft plan. For this presentation, I really wanna focus on the feedback that we heard in phase two, which was focused primarily on the priority corridors and understanding what, um, what the needs were for each corridor specifically, how people were currently using the corridor, and what people would like to see or make their, um, their movements easier, safer, and more comfortable. So what we did, we went to many community events last summer and we had cards where you could try out different street configurations. We tried to make our engagement as interactive and as easy as possible. Um, and we also coordinated with participatory budget process to make sure we could leverage resources and catch people who are already being um, engaged by the city. We attended several neighborhood meetings, um, you know, offered in general to meet people where they were going instead of asking them to come to us at standalone meetings. But we did host a city in the park event, which was really well attended and successful. We offered free pizza. Um, free school supplies because it was back to school time and had a DJ just to really provide that fun atmosphere that people felt comfortable sharing their opinions um, and experiences with transportation within the study area on these key corridors. So what did we hear? For the phase two, these are the numbers of our summary of engagement. Um, and it's important to note that we wanted to be very specific and focused on the number of online entries versus um, paper entries. And we're pretty proud of that almost half split between online and paper. And that was a very concerted effort to um, be present in the community and offer the, an easy way um, for people to give us feedback on these priority corridors. And this is a little bit deeper dive in terms of the split between those online surveys and paper surveys, surveys by corridor. Um, and you can see that in general, um, there's some corridors that had a much higher response online and some corridors where we had to be very focused to get these numbers by having more intentional community meetings and conversations. And we know that in general, online survey respondents were more white and higher income than the paper surveys. And so while we want everyone to participate, it means that we really had to work hard to counter that bias through targeted outreach events, intercept surveying and pop-up events. This is definitely an in the weeds table, but it's really helpful to show the volume of online surveys that we received from the higher income areas, such as Duke Gregson, Mangum Roxborough, as compared to Austin and Holloway feedback. It also shows how much we work to get more paper surveys on Austin, Holloway, and Fayetteville. You know, as planners in the city, we learned a lot about this process and what level of effort and budget will be needed to plan to get more representative feedback in the future and on future transportation projects. So when you hear from over 2,500 people, you hear a lot of things. And this slide just generally highlights the key topics we heard by mode. Um, and this is in a general order of priority. So we heard a lot about improved crossing needs and making intersections safer and more sidewalks. 
Um, we heard the need for protected buffered bikeways that separates um, from vehicular traffic. And then in general for transit, we heard about the need for just a better transit experience. And that can be better bus stops, better lighting, and more amenities at the bus stops and more frequent um, buses and routes. And then on the vehicular side, we heard a lot about the concern about speed on these corridors and the need for traffic calming, fixing potholes, and then improved parking availability on some of the key corridors. Specifically looking at what we heard by corridor, we analyzed the survey responses closely to find the commonalities and what seemed to be the highest priorities among residents. We sorted the data by demographics to see what residents who were more representative of the community thought. Above all, on every corridor, sidewalks and pedestrian crossing safety is a high priority. This was consistent among all demographics. We found that better bus stops and bus service were higher on the corridors that have higher transit service and ridership. Bike facilities were higher downtown and on Chapel Hill Street. Streetscaping, street trees, and public art needs were highest downtown, Fayetteville, Elizabeth Street, and along Chapel Hill. And then parking was a priority downtown as well on Holloway Street. So all of that public engagement led us to recommendations of these priority corridors. And before we get into the details of those recommendations, as I said at the beginning, Move Durham is a vision plan and does not necessarily mean that projects are funded. Move Durham establishes some policy and infrastructure priorities. And for infrastructure, um, if it's a bigger project that requires federal state money, it would need to be adopted into the Durham Chapel Hill Carborough MPO long range plan. Smaller projects, however, won't need this step. But all projects typically need funding and that would be provided through the transportation improvement program, or the capital improvement program, um, or potentially through the Durham County Transit Plan. The way funding works influence the way these recommendations are presented and detailed in that draft plan of the Move Durham Plan. All of these roads are NCDOT maintained roads, and NCDOT sees the purpose of the state highway system is to move volumes of traffic efficiently and effectively through the city and connecting to the rest of the state. There is a conflict with many of our recommendations. Many of the more impactful recommendations will require NCDOT to change this position or to transfer maintenance to the city. And maintenance does have a significant funding need. Less impactful changes along these corridors are more likely to be allowed without this um, transfer of maintenance responsibility. This plan is organized into short-term recommendations and long-term recommendations. Short-term projects are reserved for low-cost projects, policy or operational changes, or where we have some existing funding sources that can be directed to these projects. Largely, that can mean reducing the speed limit to 25 mile an hour and adjusting the signal progression um, to really help tra calm traffic. Um, it could mean repairing sidewalks and filling in the gaps, improving pedestrian crossings, improving bus stop amenities and the bus rider experience and adding bike lanes and intersection improvements where feasible. The long-term vision for each corridor um, includes more, more detailed information um, for larger streetscape type projects. And you'll find the details of this in the draft plan. Um, in general, there is a wide variety of recommendations and alternatives that we receive direct feedback from the community on. And um, some of those include two-way conversions of the downtown loop, Roxborough Street, Mangum Street, and Duke Street and Gregson. And then it also includes transit priority is the opportunity of the, count, the Durham County Transit Plan um, to really understand the transit need along each corridor and really focus on um, providing frequent, high frequency transit and just a better overall transit experience. We also looked at um, how we could separate bikeways along these corridors and it may not be continuous due to some of the constraints, but the opportunity on many of these routes to connect existing facilities together and to also connect to the um, future Beltline Trail project was a priority. 
The plan also provides planning level cost estimates in the report for each corridor, and these all require further vetting through a design process, but the key takeaway message is that these things cost money and will need to be um, you know, funded and prioritized in future city budgets. So in summary, some of the key implementation considerations for these priority corridor projects um, is acknowledging that increased roadway maintenance, um, which is about 50,000 per year per mile of facility. Um, and we also try to discuss and understand the various funding scenarios, um, such as funding projects through the Durham County Transit Plan, um, identifying different state and federal grant opportunities, providing additional CIP funding, looking at different options for transportation bond referendums, and potentially leveraging private development and investment. The opportunity to pilot some of these projects exists in a fairly low cost, um, easy implementation, and the city will definitely explore that moving forward. And then um, we wanted to address that any, any project of these priority corridors that move forward out of Move Durham will have its own process of equitable engagement. So this isn't the last time you'll be hearing about these potential improvements because we want to make sure once there is actual design funding and implementation funding, we go back to the neighborhoods and the community that will be most impacted by the project and make sure that the priorities still reflect um, the needs and, and um, desires of the community. And during the 1970s, the Durham Freeway NC-147 was built to provide a high-speed vehicle connection from the Research Triangle Park to Central Durham. NC-147's path through Durham destroyed well-established African-American communities such as the Haytai community. As a result of NC-147's construction, African-American businesses, homes, and places of worship were demolished and residents were permanently displaced. Today, NC-147 serves as a primary route through Durham with between 44,000 and 87,000 vehicles driving the corridor every day. However, the impact on adjacent communities can still be felt and NC-147 represents a significant barrier to access for many Durham residents. The Durham Freeway is the most impactful transportation project in Durham's history and any changes to it need to be approached with a comprehensive and community-rooted rooted engagement plan. While we had the intention at the beginning of the process to develop a recommendation for the future of the freeway, we concluded that this planning effort was not the right vehicle for that. Instead, um, changing the freeway would really have several implications for economic development, land use, neighborhood change, equity, and many more. And that needed to be fully understood and considered through the comprehensive plan process, which is currently ongoing. Also, we also recognize that the government coming up with a recommendation may not be received well from neighborhoods and we really needed to have a concerted focused um, community driven engagement and conversation around the impact and potential changes that could occur to the freeway. So the draft plan you'll find in the um, call to action chapter, examples of what has been done in other cities with urban freeways, um, and it also acknowledges the need for improvements, especially on the on and off ramps and the overpasses. And finally, NCDOT has a funded project in the TIP for safety and operation improvements on NC-147 through downtown. While this project is still in development, it could include closures of on and off ramps, rebuilding bridges, widening between ramps to eliminate some of the merging conflicts that are currently happening and the safety concerns. This project could also be quite impactful and the city and the community need to be aware and ready to provide feedback to NCDOT on all the different project alternatives. So that is just a very high level summary of what the draft plan entails. And now I wanna just share a little bit about the various ways that you can get involved in the process. So our we recognize the limitations of doing public engagement um, during the COVID pandemic. However, we also need to finish this plan so we can start thinking about implementation. And so while not ideal, we are moving forward with virtual engagement opportunities. And we tried, um, we tried our best to provide different opportunities for you to understand the impact. We're gonna be very accessible to you for any questions. 
Um, and we really wanted to prioritize and communicate that the engagement effort here is to check in with you and make sure that what we heard um, and what we've developed and drafted reflects your feedback and your priorities. So it is really important that we hear from as many as you as possible. And the different ways to do that um, is by checking out the plan on our project website. Um, you can go to movedurham.org and you'll find all the information there. We have a short executive summary version that you can just review that provides the highlights, um, as well as the full plan available in an interactive PDF, which means you can open that PDF and easily um, add comments, see what other people are commenting on the draft plan, and we'll be able to engage with you and respond to your questions and comments within that interactive PDF file. Um, the executive summary will also be available in Spanish, and we have an Espanol um, page on our project website that provides an overview of the project, a short survey for feedback, letting us know if you need, um, you know, translation services to help participate in this process more. We definitely want to make sure that we're accessible um, and provide Spanish translations to you if needed. We also have this recorded presentation. Um, available to you to help digest the information and we'll be doing a social media campaign to help provide um, engagement to let people be aware that the plan is released and the various ways to to get involved. We're also hosting virtual meetings. Um, there'll be one on July 11th at 10 a.m. and on July 14th at 7 p.m. And Spanish translations will be available. You'll need to register for those two virtual meetings if you want to attend and submit your questions in advance and all that information again you can find on movedurham.org. 